Welcome back to Aurora Tech Channel. Today, I will review the TiVo Up Hydro 3D printer that has a laser module. Personally, I am not a big fan of using laser modules on a 3D printer, as laser modules used on 3D printers are generally very low power and are around 1 to 2 watts. You also have to reconnect a few cables every time you switch between the print head and the laser module. But this Hydra printer comes with a modular 5 watt laser module that makes it very easy to switch between it and the print head. And it also comes with a steel plate to protect your print bed. Besides that, it includes many new generation 3D printer features such as an MKS Robin Nano 3.0 32-bit board, TMC2209 silent separate drivers with sensorless homing enabled, and a dual Z axis with a timing belt. It supports micro SD card, USB drive, and Wi-Fi printing. There's also a BMG clone direct extruder and a V6 style hot end, a 3D touch auto bed leveling sensor, and a really nice appearance with clean cable management. I would like to thank Geek Buying for sending me this machine to review, and with that, let's get started. We have the base, the gantry, the print head, the laser module, laser goggles, the filament holder and filament sensor, and some tools. First, put the gantry on top of the base and secure it using four screws. Next, slide the print head into place on the gantry and secure it using the thumb screw at the back. Now, to put together the filament holder, each side contains a bearing, a washer, and an M5 nut. Make sure that the bearings can still spin freely. Secure it on top of the gantry using T-nuts, and finally connect all the cables. Okay, we can now plug in the power cord and turn on the machine. First, home the printer to ensure that everything is working. Then, go to leveling and start leveling each of the corners. This is followed by auto bed leveling. To my surprise, I couldn't find the menu to set the Z offset, and it only showed up after auto bed leveling was done. Now, preheat the printer to feed in some filament. However, when I tried using the sample filament, a lot of it had already snapped and was not usable, so I'm going to use Airy 1 Gold Silk PLA instead. Insert the filament into the sensor, and feed it in until you see some coming out of the nozzle. I will start by printing a sample calibration cube in the USB drive. Unfortunately, the result is awful. It may have been caused by the G-code file or the format of the USB drive, which I have experienced happening before on other printers, so I sliced the cube again using my own slicer and my own USB drive, which has a lower profile and looks nicer on the printer. This time, the result looks much better, although it still isn't the best. The layers do look better now, the text is more clear, and even though I can still see a tiny bit of cooling issues here, the corners at least did not warp this time. The dimensions of the X and Z axis seem accurate, but the Y axis is a bit off. As I found the Y belt is actually a bit loose, generally we can adjust the belt tension to fix this problem, but I will talk more about this later. Now. Let's go to Cura to set up this printer. Click Add Printer, Non-Network Printer, and as this printer does not have a ready-to-use profile, I will scroll down to Creality and choose Creality cr 10 Pro, but change the name to Hydra. Next, change the print volume to 305 by 305 by 400, and remove G29 from the G-code, as the MKS firmware will glitch if there is G29. It will bring up the Z offset menu after doing G29 instead of actually printing the job. Change the bed temperature to 60 degrees and change the retraction distance to 1 millimeter. To set up the MKS Wi Fi plugin feature, click Marketplace, search for the plugin, click Install, and restart Cura. Once that is done, click Manage Printers and enable the MKS Wi Fi plugin by checking these two boxes. Click Add and type in your IP address, which can be found under the settings and the Wi-Fi menu of the printer touchscreen. Click Connect. 
go to the preview settings tab, check screenshot support, which actually means a thumbnail of your 3D model on the printer screen for a preview, and set the printer model to default. Now that that's finished, let's slice this 3D Benchy. Click print over Hydra and wait for it to upload. It won't let you check off print job, which is another bug, but don't worry as it will start the job after uploading. The result isn't the best. As you can see, there are clearly cooling issues, so let's find out what caused this. Right now, the fan duct is blowing in this area, so what we need to do is to move the duct lower and let it blow directly in this area instead. So, I'm going to remove the current fan duct, and there is only a very limited amount of space that we have to work with, so I will design a new fan duct in Fusion 360. I ended up having to make 21 iterations, with this being the first model, and this one being the last. The space that I had to work with was extremely tight, so it did take quite a bit of adjusting. These are all the 3D Benjis that I ended up printing, with many of them being unsuccessful, until these final two that were printed with the last Fanduck iteration, which turned out really nice. It took a lot of failed Fanducks to get here, but I am really happy with the result. While I didn't have a fan duct, I printed these two filament rollers using white PETG and a 0.3mm layer height to see if they work better for the filament. As cooling wasn't needed, this print turned out pretty good, but unfortunately, it doesn't work too well for holding the filament as the rollers are not that smooth on these bearings. So, I just made a simple spool holder like the one on the Ender 3 as I've never had issues with it before. The result looks pretty good, and it is definitely functional. For the filament sensor, I just used a longer M3 screw and T-nut to secure it on the top of the gantry and make sure it can still move freely to provide smooth filament feeding. Next, I will print this Bitcoin model. Even though the price of a Bitcoin has dropped quite a lot from its all-time high, I still can't afford to buy one, so I'm going to print myself one for now. The end result is nice. There were no problems, and the details all look good. Then, let's print a dragon egg with Hatchbox Bronze PLA filament. The result looks great. The patterns on the outside look nice, and the two halves of the egg fit together perfectly. After that, I will print a headphone mount with orange Hatchbox ABS filament. I tried printing without using glue to see how well the bed would stick, and apart from a little warping here, it's a pretty good print overall. Next, as the feet for this printer keep falling off, I will print four new feet using Black Overture High Speed TPU. As I wanted the printer to turn out softer, I set the infill to 10%, which is why you can still see some infill patterns at the top as it wasn't covered up very well. I can add one or two top layers to hide it, but as these feet are used under the printer's base, it doesn't really matter that much. Finally, I will test the laser module and see how well it engraves and cuts. As the size of this machine will not fit beneath my laser tent, I will use this smoke purifier from ComGrow to manage the smoke during engraving. The suction power of this 40 watt smoke purifier is not super strong, so you need to keep it close to the area you are engraving to make sure it can suck the smoke and filter it out. Let's start with an easy test of engraving text. And there were no issues. Now to test the cutting, I will try cutting through the sample 2mm plywood at different speeds and passes from 360 to 100mm per minute. It was only able to successfully cut through at 100 and 180mm per minute for speed and with 3 passes. So I will try cutting out a bigger square at 200mm per minute using 3 passes, which was successful. 
Now, I will do a test that I usually do on normal desktop laser engravers, which is engraving this logo at 2000 millimeters per minute and cutting it out at 150 millimeters per minute with three passes. The test was successful and took 18 minutes in total. I would say that this is in line with the 5 watt laser module for engraving, but not cutting, as normal engravers at 100 or 150 millimeters per minute can cut 2 millimeter plywood in a single pass, but this laser module seems weaker and needs 3 passes. Still, for a logo that's only 60 by 60 millimeters, the details still look pretty nice. Let's talk about the pros and cons of this printer, starting with the pros. One. The assembly is easy, and the modular print head and laser head design is really good. Swapping between them just requires using the one thumb screw at the back. However, you need to pay attention to the instructions. If you slide the tool head in upside down even one time, it will damage the shrapnel connectors on the plate. If you need to replace them, they are pretty cheap and only cost a few dollars for 10 connectors but it would be better to have some sort of anti-upside-down mechanism like a slot or a groove that only allows the tool head to slide in with the correct orientation. Two, it has a good appearance. The metal covers of the print head and laser head are nice. It also uses ribbon cables for cleaner cable management, and it came with a one-piece injection molded base like a sports car. Three, it supports USB drive, micro SD card, and Wi-Fi printing. The motherboard is an MKS Robin Nano with an ESP8266 Wi-Fi module, and the MKS Cura plugin works pretty well. You can just send the print job to the printer directly from Cura, which is convenient, but like all other Wi-Fi enabled 3D printers with an ESP module, if the G-code file is larger than a few megabytes, it will take a few minutes to upload as the ESP module communicates with the serial port of the motherboard. Four. It uses TMC2209 silent stepper drivers with sensorless homing enabled on the X and Y axis and uses the 3D touch to home the Z axis, so mechanical or optical limit switches are not needed on this machine. 5. The X axis uses a 20 by 60 aluminum extrusion instead of the 20 by 20 extrusion used on most other 3D printers, making it look more sturdy. 6. The AC heated bed heats up quickly and much faster than other normal heated beds that are powered by the DC power supply of the 3D printer. For your reference, a 300 by 300 millimeter print bed with a 360 watt DC power supply on other printers will take more than 15 minutes to heat up to 100 degrees Celsius, but this AC heated bed will only take around 2 minutes. 7. The wire management inside the base is nice. It uses ferrules on all connectors, which the manufacturer did a better job with than some other big brands. However, there are also some quality issues that I will talk more about in the cons section. Now for the cons. One, the part cooling fan duct is not blowing directly at the nozzle, but after replacing it with a new fan duct, it works pretty well. Perhaps using a volcano style heated block would be better as the fan duct can be taller and reflect the air better like the one I made for the CR-10S Pro V2. 2. The filament holder's design is inconvenient, as the width of every filament roll can be different. Whenever you change from one brand to another, you may need to adjust the width of the filament holder using a hex driver to make sure the edges of the filament roll sit nicely on these small bearings or it may affect the feeding of the filament and cause under extrusion. I didn't see any advantages in this design compared to the most basic filament mount, so I made a very simple filament mount and secured it with M5 screws and T-nuts to the top gantry. They work very well, so I would just stick with this design rather than the original design. 3. The AC heated bed is glued under the glass bed. I can't exactly say the glass bed is now impossible to change, but it would be a bit challenging to do that without tearing off or damaging the silicon AC heated bed underneath. 4. The gaps in the base are not useful in any way. They increase the chance of dropping filament residue or other unwanted stuff into the base, which has the motherboard, the power supply, the SSR relay for the AC heated bed, which is no good. If some gaps are required for better air circulation, opening them on the side of the base instead of the top would be a better idea. 5. 
this printer comes with almost all the latest features you can expect from a new generation 3D printer. Surprisingly, it does not come with belt tensioners, and when I printed the calibration cube, I could see that the Y axis is a bit off as the Y belt tension is looser than the X belt. But since the difference wasn't that bad, I will keep using it for a while. When you need to adjust it in the future, I will cut the belt and retighten it with zip ties. 6. The small rubber feet under the machine are just secured by double sided tape. The adhesion is not strong enough and it comes off too easily. I printed some TPU feet and secured them again with better quality double sided tape, although glue would be better too. I think these feet are very important as the stepper driver cooling fan is at the bottom of the base, so we need the base to be raised above the table to make sure the fan can draw cool air from outside to cool down the stepper drivers. 7. The maximum nozzle temperature is supposed to reach 240 degrees Celsius, but when I tried printing something at that temperature, the printer firmware automatically adjusted it to 231 degrees Celsius. This may be a safety feature to make sure the hot end temperature does not get too high, and I can still adjust it manually to 240 degrees Celsius when I print ABS, but it's a little weird to have to do that manually. In conclusion, the idea of the swappable tool heads is great, and it does work. Switching between the print head and the laser head is easy, and is at least easier than any other machine with interchangeable tool heads that I have reviewed in the past. The print quality is actually pretty good after replacing the part cooling fan duct. For those minor issues that I mentioned in the cons section, if you have 3D printing experience, it shouldn't be that big of a deal. But for someone who is new to 3D printing, it could be quite frustrating. If you mainly use this as a 3D printer and do some engraving or thin wood cutting occasionally, this machine is capable of doing those kinds of jobs. The price of $469 is reasonable as most new generation 300x300x400 3D printers cost pretty much the same. However, if you want to use the laser feature frequently and do more wood cuttings, paying more to buy a 3D printer like the Sidewinder X2 with an AC heated bed and the same print volume for around $400, plus another 5 watt desktop laser engraver for around $300, or a 10 watt engraver for $400 separately would be the better option. I put the links to this machine, the fan duct, the filament holder, and other 3D models that I printed in this video under the description. That's it for this video. If you liked this video, please do like and subscribe to my channel and press the bell icon to receive new video updates. I will see you next time.